We'll see how this goes. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Chapag Valley Bible Church. Uh, I have a, just a couple of announcements for you this morning. Um, I was talking to Rosie yesterday, and guess what's coming? Christmas. Yes, and with <laughs> Christmas comes... Shoeboxes. Shoe boxes. Yes, okay, yes. Yeah. So she's already working on that. So uh, one thing that she told me that I didn't know is there are only a certain number of um, countries that actually do the packing. Uh, Australia, Austria, Canada, Finland, Germany, New Zealand, Spain, Switzerland, the UK, and the US. So those are the countries that actually do the packing. And their goal, uh, Samaritan's person's goal in the next five years is to reach 1,000 Pacific Islands. So they're looking to um, all the places where Jesus' name has not yet been heard. So keep an eye out for putting <coughs> stuff like that in those boxes. And then uh, last week she did announce she has a lovely basket um, on the table there. So if you are interested in donating to any of those organizations that the missions team has done such a nice job of, um, exposing us to Barnabas Aid, Open Doors, Voice of the Martyrs, or the Persecution Project, which is specifically for Northern Sudan. Um, she has envelopes there in the basket, so you can take a look at those um, at the end of the service. All right, so this morning, I'm going to read Psalm 8. Psalm 8. Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Heavenly Father, we see your majesty this morning in this beautiful place, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this place to meet. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have salvation, in whom we have hope, in whom we have great joy. Lord, may our minds be quieted this morning. May our hearts be prepared as we may worship you and hear from your word and learn what you would have us to do as we go forth. In your son's holy name, amen. Amen. Hello, hello. hello. Let's do this one. We just decided this one now, so um, hopefully I can get through it without fumbling around too much.
hearts out to you, Lord. You are so good. We thank you. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you that you have shown that you love us, each one of us, individually. And uh, we praise you, God. Amen. Uh, lead Troy now and bring that word. to harm you if you are eager to do good, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteousness, unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Amen. Shields down. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Some of you might have uh, caught it that uh, yeah, I had the exploding water again, and wisely, before I got up here, I opened it, and sure enough, <laughs> see, we learn. We learn from our mistakes, and we make new ones. So you ready to make uh, make much of Jesus this morning? Amen. Amen. I love that verse. Thank you, Cynthia. I love that letter. First Peter is an amazing letter, you know. I, I, and I don't want to get <coughs> sidetracked off the focus of the message, but Peter's amazing. This is, uh, you know, he's a fisherman. You know, if you ever hung out at a dock or if you know any fishermen, they're kind of like truck drivers. You talk about how truck drivers have a particular language. You know, fishermen are kind of in that group. So this is this, this rough and tumble kind of guy, you know, and uh, he goes to preach in the first sermon. The Lord blesses it. They round up about 3,000. And, uh, you know, and, and then he writes this amazing letter, only through the inspiration and, you know, the Holy Spirit and, and the movement of God could these things take place. You know, so God is in the business of transformation. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into becoming more like Christ. So, uh, Lord, just thank you this morning. Lord, please bless this assembly of your people. Lord, uh, just fill us with your Holy Spirit. Uh, help us to be attentive. Open our hearts and our minds, uh, Lord, to your word. We desire to become more like our Master and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to talk about a fancy word today. Uh, I'm just going to get the word out of the way now so the shock hits. And, and then we can just kind of agree that we'll move on from here. So, we're going we're gonna to talk about Jesus today, but we're going to do that within the context of apologetics. Okay, so I just said the word apologetic. So if you've heard it and you know it and you're comfortable with it, great. If not, don't worry. Um, and we'll take care of that. See, because there's a reason we're talking about apologetics today. There is not, there's no randomness to what we're doing. We worship a God of order. We should attempt to be ordered. So we talked about the Great Commission a few weeks back uh, and that we are to make disciples. And I'm going to keep saying that. And, you know, you would argue, well, why do you keep repeating these things? Well, if, if they didn't need repeating, right? Everyone would just be out there doing them and the churches would be filled and instead of two billion people claiming Christianity and five not, it would be the other way around. The bears repeating because we have work to do and we need to constantly be reminded of it. So the Great Commission, make disciples, we've been talking about that. In order to do that effectively, we talked about needing unity, what Christian unity was. We have to, we have to be, we have to be of like mind in Christ. We, we cannot be a fractured group and expect to make disciples. We have to be like minded in Christ. And then we talked about on uh, the first day, uh, as, as pastor here with you all, we talked about how 
We're, we're thinking about Abram and how he was called out by God and he was faithful even though he didn't know where he was going. And what was the promise? That he was going to be blessed so that he could be a blessing to others. In fact, a blessing uh, to all families and all nations. So it's all about Jesus and it's all about following his command to make more disciples so that more people know Jesus, the kingdom grows, and then really rinse and repeat that famous instruction uh, that made uh, shampoo and conditioner uh, companies a lot of money. Rinse and repeat. But we're not after money, we're after saving souls. So, we need to know what matters. That's the title of the, of the sermon, to know what matters. Uh, we need to know the things we need to know. We need to know what we need to be doing so we can fully engage the mission that Jesus gave us before he ascended. His last words, the things that he decided to say before he bodily ascended, we should pay careful attention to. So, something else you'll hear me say a lot, which is sad, is that America is currently, we're, we're a post-Christian nation. I've said that in the last couple of sermons, and that bears repeating, because you have to understand the mission field if you're going to be able to share the gospel with, with the people around you. You've got to know what you're up against. We're in a post-Christian world. We can no longer accept that here in America people have heard of Jesus. We can't expect that they know anything meaningful about the Bible, what's contained within it. We can't expect that when times get tough, they're going to come seek out church and, and find that answer. They're not doing those things anymore. We are in the fourth largest mission field in the world here in America, post-Christian, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and these behaviors have already been in place if people have been pulling away from God. Now with the pandemic, this behavior is getting reinforced because culturally as just a group of people, we're getting taught to stop gathering and stop getting together. And even if a vaccine is released and, and things kind of die down, some of this behavior won't be lost. Okay, so we, we've got it. For a long time, church has been a place where you kind of threw the doors open and you waited to greet guests on a Sunday. And, and for a long time that happened. That it's not gonna happen so much anymore. It's not that it won't ever happen. And we should be ready for it to happen and live and, and worship in that way and serve in that way. But we're going to have to go out a lot more. Okay, if we want to do God's work, if we want to fulfill the Great Commission, we have to get ready uh, to be out and about. Studies have found recently that a significant uh, percentage of the non-Christian population of the United States has no meaningful relationships with any Christians. Try to get your head around that. That's unbelievable. How is it that so many non-Christians don't know meaningfully any Christians in this country? Where are we? What has happened to all of us? As a group, not this church, as a group of Christians in, in, in the western part of the world, clearly not engaging those who do not know Christ because otherwise those numbers wouldn't be what they are. A few things occur to me as to why this might be the case. Just a quick, brief look at why this might be happening. We've become insular, right? We're, we're hanging out with other Christians. Birds of a feather flock together, right? Maybe those who say they're Christian mm -hmm. aren't really true Christians. That can also be a thing. And so therefore, they just won't be engaging their faith because they're really not as sincere about it as they kind of think. I think of the parable of the sower and the different people that received the word and, and who they really are and only one group at the end right really got it and, and those seeds fell in fertile soil and there was growth okay also there's a real social and cultural hostility toward our faith that I, I believe is, is, is causing a subset among us to kind of get silent because they're, they're intimidated by that and they're human and we give them grace I don't say that to call out anybody or to do that as a scolding but some people in the face of of that kind of hostility are gonna get quiet. But then finally, I think that there's, there's a lot of Christians who really believe and they wanna be bold in their faith, that, but, but they're, not, they're not trained well to engage others with confidence, so they hold back, because what will hold you back from doing something that requires courage more than anything else is not thinking you can do it, not having the confidence, not, not knowing what you need to know in order to be effective. That will hold you back like nothing else. It holds me back. Let me tell you. So those are the, the, the reasons, I think, why Christians are not on the map so clearly right now. Why, why so many non-Christians don't know 
Christians. So we're going to talk about apologetics. Apologetics just means to defend the faith. That's it. It comes from a Greek word, apologia. It means to speech in defense of. Okay. Um, apologetics is a pretty broad field. The defense of the faith can range across a, a vast amount of subjects all related to the Christian faith. It could be anything from evidence for the manuscripts that we have that contain the words of the Bible, right? We don't have any of the original documents. We have what are called extant manuscripts, copies. Okay, and, and at some point I look forward to talking to you about what that means and how much evidence we have and, and why that's trustworthy. That's one area of apologetics. Uh, you could, there, there's Christian philosophy uh, as, a, as a way of defending the faith. Uh, sci Christian scientists, not the faith, but scientists who are Christian defend the faith and talk about how the Bible gives us true scientific information when it presents it. It's not a scientific manual, but when it talks about science, those things are true. Um, mathematics, evolution, uh, you know, where, where, how does that work? What, what's the story there? Uh, logic, the idea of critical thinking, all these areas can fall under apologetics depending on who you are, how God's equipped you, where he's called you to serve, what, he, what he's asking you to do. Okay, and they have various degrees of complexity depending on who you are and who your audience is. But apologetics can also simply consist of answering a question that someone has about a verse. Someone may ask you, I've, I've heard you quote John 3.16, what does it mean that God gave his only begotten son? Can you answer that question? That, the answers to scripture, someone just asking you a question about the faith, they've read something in the Bible about God, and they just want to know an answer to that, that is the most common form of apologetics, of defending the faith. And there's a misconception, I say that because a lot of people think that when, when you say the word apologetics, you're, you're on some peripheral track and, and it's not really related to evangelism. And, and No, that, that's not true. It has everything to do with evangelism. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm not being heretical here talking about the subject this morning. And I'm going to hopefully prove that <clears throat> because Cynthia read a great verse that offers up a defense of why we need to defend. I made that up on the spot, folks. I want to read um, the verses again really quick uh, before we launch into them. We're going to do a little bit of an exegetical study tomorrow. If you've never heard the word exegesis before, exegetical just means to study so we gain a little bit of a critical understanding of what the text is trying to tell us. That's all. Another big fancy word. Academics are great for creating these fancy words, you know. So, I have the ESV translation. Uh, I use that a lot. I don't use it exclusively. I like the NASB. I also refer to the NIV. You know, we're Christianity, great for acronyms, right? Mm -hmm. So, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. If you've got it open, follow along. Depending on your version, a few words might be different. Mine says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Okay? Our exegesis this morning is going to be a little light because we're going to try to get this done in the context of one message this morning. So we're not going to do a super deep dive, but we're going to touch on some, uh, some of the content here. There's eight verses in the New Testament that use this word apologia, apologetics, defense. There's eight verses in the New Testament that talk about defense. There's just a few more. I'm not going to go over all of them. Just for some context, kind of fill in that Peter isn't the only one talking about this or making this statement. In Acts 22, uh, verse 1, when Paul offers his personal testimony, he says, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. And in Philippians 1 7, Paul writes, Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. Later in Philippians 1 16, he says, Knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. 
And then there's additional verses, and maybe some of you will surprise me next week, and you'll have looked them up and say, hey, Pastor Troy, I found them. Clearly, Scripture is indicating the questions about the faith are to be answered, and that opposition is to be defended against. We are not to just lay down and, and watch these things just go by us. A lot of great apologists out there in our day. There has been a bit of a, a renaissance uh, in apologetics. The apologetics goes all the way back to Clement of Rome, who is one of the disciples of the apostles, uh, of Tertullian, of Justin Martyr. And, you know, you may have never heard of these guys, but they have volumes. You know, this is the first century. Volumes of apologetics explain to Rome why they should be embracing the Christians who live among them rather than persecuting them. They're defending the faith. Why are you killing us all? Don't you know what we stand for? We're good for you. This is what the, this is what the faith is really about. Okay, so this goes way back. Well, we've had a bit of a renaissance. We have some great guys out there. William Lane Craig, one of my favorite apologists, uh, he's an amazing author and writer. Uh, so I, I suggest him for those of you that can handle big words. But if you don't like big words, there's other guys like Greg Kukul, uh, Charlie Campbell, who I'm going to quote in a moment. Uh, you can check in with me about that. i got a long list, so if you're looking for some new stuff to read, uh, come my way and, and, I'll, and I'll, get you, I'll get you set up. Charlie Campbell I really like. He runs a website called Always Be Ready, ABR, because we like acronyms. He said this about Christians and apologetics. Now listen to this. This is a bit of a jarring quote. This shook me the first time I read this. He said, can you imagine being an ambassador for your country and neglecting to prepare yourself for the common questions that people ask about your homeland. That would be irresponsible. And you'd be without a job very quickly. Now what's interesting is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God tells us that we are his ambassadors. God's language, not mine. So seeing as that is the case, right? I think it's important that we all consider this question, am I, are you ready to answer common questions that people may ask you about God? Are you ready to explain to someone why you believe the Bible is a trustworthy source that tells you about God and leads you to belief and faith in him? So first Peter 3, 15, and 16, our verses for this morning, says that we are to be ready to give a defense of our faith. We should be ready to answer those questions when they come our way. Are you ready? Sadly, many Christians, along with everybody else, because we struggle, you know, we've got a foot here, and then there's defense, and then we've got a foot here, and, you know, we struggle. We're human. Jesus knows this cross is bigger but many Christians along with everyone else watch more secular TV in a week than they'll spend in a year preparing themselves to answer questions about God and the Bible. I don't mean that as an insult and please don't be offended as I, as I say any of these things because the statistics don't lie. We're part of a larger body and we're not gaining as much as we're losing so we, what can we do? How can we change that? Don't leave defending your faith to others. It's not everybody else's job. You know what they say when you point at someone, Joe, it's your job. Well, there's three fingers pointing back at me telling me it's my job. Right? The church needs an army of saints who are able to articulate the truth persuasively and graciously. And if you don't like to talk, ask God to get you an errand. Moses did. Okay? Don't let anything stop you. Okay, in the, in, the, in the letter from Jude, Jude says in, in verse 3, we're called to contend earnestly for the faith. Contend, to wrestle, to fight. Meg Ryan from, you know, what is it, You've Got Mail? Fight, fight for the death. <laughs> Watched the movie so many times with Kelly. I'm not a rom-com guy, but that's a funny movie. So with Charlie Campbell's quote fresh in our minds, this idea of the responsibility of an ambassador to be able to answer just common questions about your homeland. Everybody, we're outside. It's nice out. Close your eyes. I want you to imagine how the conversation might go 
if you met someone today, tomorrow, and they asked you one of the following questions, this is you now, you're being asked this question, well, can't I be good without God? Or, if God is, is good, why does he allow evil and suffering? Or, someone who's maybe read the Bible asks you, how can you worship a God who orders the genocide of men, women, and children like the Israelites were told by God in the Old Testament? How would you answer those questions if you were asked them today or tomorrow? Could you answer them? No intent, and if you're answering, if you're, if you're thinking to yourself, I have no idea what I would say. I'm, again, not here to scold, but let that be a wake-up call, and that's okay, because we're looking ahead to what we're all going to be doing together. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to learn how to together be able to answer these things. We all as a group want to, want to do this, right? So we're stronger together. Don't be scared. All right? The scary part, I say don't be scared. The next word in my mind is the scary part. <laughs> There's many more questions like these that both enemies of the faith and seekers of the faith are asking and expecting Christians to answer today, right now. And so, if we actually care about the lost, and we certainly should, and if we intend to provide answers when they ask questions about God, and we certainly should, then we need, in some measure, to be apologists. We have to respond affirmatively to Peter's call in his verses to be prepared to defend give an answer for the hope that we have. So this is where we want to get a little exegetical for a minute, right? We want to look at what Peter specifically wrote. He starts by saying, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And that's my version, um, and I picked my translation of it because I like that word honor that's in there. That's an imperative statement. Regardless of your translation, Peter is giving you a command. He's telling you to do something. If you're a Christian, you have received salvation through the free gift of grace from God, through the work, through the person of Jesus. So now we are instructed to honor the source of our salvation. And so when we honor something, what do we do? We hold it in high regard, okay? You, got, you have a Bible with you? You know, I honor the Bible. I hold this. This is the living word of God. I honor this book. This, this book is above me. I hold it in a high place. Okay? That's what it means to honor something. A soldier honors his country, proudly displays his allegiance. Soldiers freely go around when they, you know, in their uniforms, depending on what they're doing. They, they have flags on their vehicles, what branch of the military they serve from. They're proud to, to serve their country. They display their allegiance. A husband honors his wife, speaks lovingly of her. A wife respects her husband, speaks respectfully of him. They love one another, right? They, they honor each other, okay? That's, that's how you honor one another. It's one of the things that's always amazed me throughout my years of being married to Kelly is depending on where I've worked and who I've been around, the way that, that I've heard people talk about their spouses when you just gather for lunch or breaks in the workplace, you're working alongside each other. And I don't care where we've been at in our relationship and we've had ups and downs over the years I've never talked about her like that to anybody and I don't understand why anyone would because because what's that showing they don't honor their spouse the honor's missing right soldiers a good soldier does not speak derogatorily about the United States of America he speaks proudly or she speaks proudly of her country because they, they honor it so same with us okay same with us we're Christians, okay? We honor and love the Lord Jesus. We hold him up high, right? That song that says, lift his name up on, on high. We do that. We honor the Lord, okay? So this verse, this is an exhortation to us. It's an encouragement from Peter to live a life of holiness that includes obedience rooted in our love and honor of Jesus, okay? That's what Peter's getting at. Then he goes right into a practical part of this. He gives us this sort of lofty command to honor the Lord. But then he says, how, one way to do it, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason that the hope is in you. The, the hope that is in you. It's a two-part statement. Let's look at it in two parts. Always be prepared to make a defense. 
defense. The ability to defend something effectively takes serious practice. You can watch Enter the Dragon. See, John Saxon just died, one of the actors from Enter the Dragon. I'm a big Bruce Lee fan, so it's kind of sad that I read that. Um, you can watch Enter the Dragon. You can watch Bruce Lee on, in the movie scenes your whole life. You're not going to be a good martial artist if that's the end of your training, is just to watch Bruce Lee do amazing things on screen. You're going to have to actually go get training. Thaddeus is, is months away from getting his black belt in Taekwondo. He's been doing this for four years, three, four days a week, you know, training, right? So to defend something effectively takes serious practice. It takes training. We're going to have to train hard, train often, so that we can demonstrate to show that we do, in fact, honor Christ like we say we do by being able to offer a good defense for our faith when we're called to do so. You follow that? Doing apologetics is kind of like firing a gun. Why do I say that? We're going to do a little bit of a thought exercise. Okay, you guys with me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a paragraph, and then I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to switch something out in it. So, I, you know, and I think I'm being clever here. Hopefully I am. But, so I'm letting you know what I'm going to do ahead of time so you listen to it knowing what's coming. Okay? So here's the first paragraph. Police officers are daily in a heightened state of awareness. This means that they're training is more readily deployed in real world life and death situations. They may have to draw their gun and fire it at any moment. In order to ensure the greatest possible chance that they will hit their intended target, police officers must train at the firing range regularly many hours a year alongside other police officers. Okay? Now, here's the reword. Christians are daily in a heightened state of awareness. This means that their training is more readily deployed in real world life and death situations. They may have to proclaim Christ as Lord and speak and defend the gospel message at any moment in order to ensure the greatest possible chance that they will reach the lost. For Christ, Christians must train at church and at Sunday school and small groups regularly, many hours a year, always alongside other Christians. Who should be training more rigorously, police officers or Christians? What's more important, this life or the life to come, friends? Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul writes, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. He isn't saying to ignore earthly things, but set your mind. Where is it going to go to first? What's your first thought, your first inclination when things are going on around you? It's all about priorities. We become proficient at the things that we make a priority, whether they're important or useless or any place in between. What you give your time to is what you will become good at. The second half of Peter's statement says to anyone, right, we're told to make a defense, always be prepared, ready to defend, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. It's a good moment to be introspective. Sometimes the Bible, if you, you, you're reading it in that way, you just kind of pause and you ask yourself this question. What's the reason for the hope that's in me? got to be ready to give a reason, you know, to give a defense of it. What's your hope? Can you articulate it? Can you, can you say it? Can you explain it? Do you actually have hope? I hope you do. Because I ask that question seriously, because sometimes faith can become just a sort of series of religious check marks in our boxes that we tick off. We kind of get in a routine. Okay, we got to be careful. It's very easy to fall into that. I hope your faith, your hope is, is alive and well within you. What is it? It's more than just saying, I, I hope that I win the lottery. I hope it doesn't rain while we're outside, right? That's, that's, that's the world's version of hope. Christian hope. The biblical definition of hope. Confident 
expectation. In what? It's rooted in, in faith and in the divine salvation found in Christ. Christian hope is this. God's salvation of his people in Jesus Christ. How that salvation will reveal itself at the end of human history. At the second coming of the King of Kings. Boy, you know, I'm scared. Revelation's a bit of a scary book, but I'm excited. I can't wait. A Christian's hope is not a what. In the final analysis, it's a who. It is Jesus. Christians are expected, according to Peter in this verse, right, to be prepared to speak at any moment about their hope, to be able to speak about it competently, to be able to defend the truth of it if challenged. <coughs> Don't be scared. We're all in this together, friends. Peter concludes these two verses with a pretty big chunk, and this is where we're going to kind of deal with this as, as, as a big piece. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, and I have to work on that. I'm a spoiled only child. Boy, there's nobody like me when it comes to having opinions. If I'm right, I'm right. <coughs> Lord have mercy. Yet with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. As a group in this country, how well do you think Christians are doing? I'll tell you, I won't cross the line right here. So a while back, I'll tell you a story. I'll take a break from the, you know, things can get pretty intense up here. I used to be on Facebook, and I probably have to get back there at some point, so I'm sure a number of you are out there, and I want to I wanna be part of your community as many ways as I can. But I used to be on Facebook a little bit more often, and... I was in some, uh, I love board games. I've got a wall of board games at home. Um, love playing with friends. I got friends coming over tonight. So, friends I've met at church, good Christian friends. We bust out the, the board games, have a good night together, fellowship. I'm in this group on Facebook talking for board games. And a while ago, this was last year, maybe the year before, there was a conversation about just the LGBT community, their inclusivity, how the board game community wasn't welcoming to them, and, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't mean anything by that, it's always a tough conversation to have, right? And so I kind of wait in there, and I say, well, in, in the sense of coming together to play a board game, I'm not really concerned about your sexual orientation or your belief system for playing a game. Are you a decent human being? Will you treat me politely? I will treat you politely. We can just simply love one another over the course of doing something that's a shared enjoyment. Like, that's good, we can do that, you know? Somebody fired back at me in this conversation, you know, because I'm the Christian, saying I'm a Christian. This is, I don't care how you would act. There's no way I'd be willing to sit at a table and play a game with a Christian believing what you do about my community. Wow, you know, I was I was a little shell shocked by that, but then I asked myself, why does this person think that? Because anytime you're ready to wag a finger, remember the three pointing back to you. Jesus said, before you worry about the splinter in the other guy's eye, worry about the log in yours, right? Get introspective. Check in with God. See where you're at. And so I said, well, what are Christians doing? So I kind of rummaged around a little bit. When a group of Christians pick it, now these are, these are from real headlines and news things that I've read as much as any news can be true. So there is that caveat. When a Christian group pickets an abortion clinic with signs to say things like, stop the baby slashers, and does your doctor kill babies? Or when Christians attend rallies against same-sex marriage and they shout things or have signs to say, God didn't create Adam and Steve and stop perverting marriage. Are any of them upholding the idea of gentleness and respect that Peter is telling us to do? Is anyone receiving the gospel message if that's how the Christians are behaving? I'm going to argue no. Because if you come at me like that about something you believe in, I'm going to stop hearing you about three words after you come at me because your attitude stinks, your words stink, everything stinks. I just got the gloves up. There's no conversation we're having. I'm not receiving anything you have, okay? This has happened to various degrees. 
yeah, Westboro Baptist Church, they're, they're crazy people. May Lord have mercy on them. They're not real Christians. But there are other real Christian churches that I've read that have said some highly unpleasant and inappropriate things and that is not advancing the cause of Christ. Okay? I believe that rather than approaching these crises from a, a, of life, from a position of hope, based on the message of the gospel, a lot of Christians are just freaking out. They're terrified that God has lost control of the bus or something, and they're reacting terribly due to insecurity. And I talked about this with Rebecca last week. People uh, were afraid of losing our comfort. I kind of say tough nuggies. It's not about your comfort. You know? We are called, Peter calls us in these verses to a higher standard than that. We're to engage others with gentleness and respect. That doesn't mean we're compromising. The gospel doesn't get compromised. You compromise the gospel, I'll call you out. Okay? But it, it means that we can do the truth saying with consideration and courtesy. We don't need to feel angry or frustrated if we don't see an immediate response to our evangelism friends. We're called to do the work. God will handle the results in his perfect time. And we should not lash out if we think that the opponents of God are winning. Guess what? They're not. We win. God wins. Victory is assured. That's the gospel, the good news. What's the good news? The battle is won. It's safe to return to your homes. What's our job? To simply offer a reasonable defense of our faith in an attempt to reach those that need to get the message. Jesus said, I came for the sick, not for the righteous. All right, that's the mission. Reach the lost. Make disciples. Not maintain our cultural comforts. All right, and we're all going to want to do that to some degree, okay? We live in America, and there's plenty of comforts we have, and they're nice, friends, okay? But they can't rule us. If by our efforts of following the Great Commission, we end up swinging the culture some way back toward God, and some comforts are maintained or returned, well, that's great. But the goal is to reach the lost, not to get the comforts. Okay, we'll shout loud praises to God. If, if, if culture starts to swing back the other way, wouldn't that be wonderful given the current state of affairs? My goodness. Now, we're called to be gentle. We're called to be respectful. But even if we are, no matter how well we do that, we should still expect to face opposition and even persecution due to the truth we're sharing. Just because we say it nice still doesn't mean it's going to get received well. That's not, that's not what we're told. And Peter says in the next chapter, chapter 4, he says, Beloved, now he's talking about persecution. He says, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised when you share the gospel message, no matter how nice, and you get yelled at or hurt in some way. Okay? Are we good? I love you guys. So in this verse... These two verses, 15 and 16 in chapter 3, we see a clear what and how that we need to obey. If I just kind of wanted to sum all of this up into just a brief sentence, honor Jesus in our hearts and demonstrate, show that by being, show that by being prepared to respectfully defend our faith. Honor Jesus in our hearts and demonstrate that by being prepared to respectfully defend our faith. That's a, a, a good summary. God does not command you or me to do anything that he will not get behind. So if you're kind of feeling like, like, who am I, Lord? I can't do this. What are you asking me to do? I can't talk to people. Whatever, whatever worry might be bubbling up, what did God tell Joshua? One of those like home run verses in scripture, right? Have I not commanded you? What does that imply? He just told Joshua to do some stuff. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. What a verse. And then a good one from the New Testament. I just quoted this, right? For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. The Holy Spirit is with you. He is with you. We need to live, friends. We need to follow the commands of scripture like we believe the 
that what we're being told is true, right? To confess with your lips, believe in your heart. So if you're starting to shift in your seat and you're looking for your car keys, like I said earlier, I don't want anyone to panic here. There's no expectation that anyone here head off to seminary, so just stay put. Okay? <laughs> That's not what we're talking about this morning. That's not what Peter's talking about. However, the verses that Peter says do turn the notion, the cultural notion, that apologetics, that defense of the faith, is just for those with doctrines. It turns that notion on its head because that's not who he's addressing. He's addressing Christians. So whether or not you're an extrovert like me <laughs> or an introvert, whether or not you're good or bad at reading, whether or not you have a good or bad memory, whether you're busy or you have extra free time, regardless of your personality, regardless of your giftedness, these verses from 1 Peter, if you believe in Jesus, they apply to you. Because God didn't give exception clauses with the verses, guys. But God's going to be with you. He's going to empower you. He already has. If you're a Christian, you already have the power. You've got to tap into it, right? He's going to lead you to opportunities if you're faithful, right? You're blessed so you can bless others. And when you courageously engage people in the name of Christ, even if you don't like to talk to people and you feel like crawling out of your skin, but you say, okay, Lord, there's the bus. I'm going to step in front of it. Hit me. Okay? God's going to be at your side. And who knows? Maybe he'll redirect the bus. God's sovereignty, the things he does, man's responsibility, our part in all of it. So even though he's going to be with us, even though he empowers us, that doesn't mean that we have a get-out-of-jail-free card. We still have to train and prepare. We still have a responsibility that we have to pursue and do here. Training can prepare each of us, friends. We can learn what the common questions of our faith are. Don't you want to know those things? And don't you want to be able to to respond to them when you're asked about them. There's a lot of this happening in the public square. I asked a couple of these before. Why does a good God allow evil and suffering? That's a whopper of a question, and people are asking it. They're not going to ask you the easy ones. <laughs> what about all those apparent contradictions in the Bible? I've got a, I've got a book by Paul Colton called Is, Is God a Moral Monster? And then, and then the book just deals with all of these contradictions and tough moral quandaries that are in Scripture. You know? And the opponents of the skeptics, they know those verses and they're going to come at you with them. How can Jesus be the only way to God? That doesn't seem fair. Okay? You're going to get asked that. What about those who have never heard of Jesus? What happens to them? They go to hell? That doesn't seem very nice. Okay? Is it just blind faith to believe in God? That's just a dusty old book. We can kind of chuckle and have fun as we go through these, right? But the person asking them, if it's a seeker, and not someone just looking to beat you up, because those people are out there, but if it's a seeker, what did I say last week? You may be the only Bible that someone reads. It's not as complicated as you might think to provide reasonable responses to those questions. Does it involve some training? Yes, of course it does. But you're not going to need a PhD here, okay? In the months to come, we're going to be talking about these questions. I'm looking forward. The roadmap, I, I pray daily for God to start to give me some vision, some direction as I get to know some of you. Where are we going? And some of this is starting to come together. We're going to talk about these questions, how any of us can answer them. We'll train together. Who knows? It might be fun. <laughs> Says the guy who like devours books for like, you know, for fun, you know. I'm not crazy. Hey, listen, the Lord revealed himself primarily after Jesus, right? What did he do? He directed everybody to write a book. If Jesus Christ is Lord of our hearts, instead of fear, when confronted with arguments against our faith, we should experience confidence. And we should have a willingness to engage if Jesus is Lord of your heart. We should want to be prepared, given that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Spirit's going to, if we're trying to tap in, and we're doing our due Christian diligence, and we're engaging our faith, and we're trying to get close to God, if we do all these things, let the word of Christ dwell richly in your heart. If you're reading your scripture, if you're meeting God in prayer, you're going to find this to be the case, okay? It, 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 the real deal. So many people out there need to know Jesus.
this. Remember what I said? There's like 7.3 billion people on the planet, give or take. Only about 2 billion of them have the Christian checkbox ticked. And how many of them are genuine? Lots of people need to know Jesus, friends. It is our sacred responsibility to share the gospel competently with those that God places in our paths. We should be able to muster some defense for our faith when we are confronted by skeptics, if we're taking Peter seriously here. And taking Peter seriously means we're taking God seriously, because God inspired Peter to write exactly what God wanted written there. God has, do you understand, when we say God, this is why I've, I've, I've done this before, this is the creator of the universe, folks. And, and so the creator of the universe knows each one of us personally and intimately and has stuff specifically for us individually to do. The creator of the universe, that's mind-blowing to me. He's extended this unbelievable privilege by asking us to join him in his work. The Great Commission, right, tells us to make disciples. That is an intentional activity. We're not meant to stay within the safety of our churches and in the safety of our walls. We're not walls right now, but you know what I'm saying. We're not supposed to just stay put until Jesus comes back, okay? Christianity is not an evacuation plan. No correction intended to the people sitting here specifically. Body of Christ, primarily the Western Church. We got work to do, friends. Let's admit that. Let's not pummel ourselves over it. Let's not dwell on the past, right? New beginnings. But we got work to do. We really need to obey the Great Commission. We got to take the words of Christ seriously. Okay? We live in 2020. Okay? That means social media is a thing. Ugh. It's good, right? But it's horrible, too. Okay? And it matters. It matters so much. The internet is filled, the bursting with comments about every conceivable topic. And a lot of it is, is content that is hostile to Christianity and meant to slander Jesus and our faith and each one of us. They're out there looking for any mistake we're going to make. Boy, they ride that real hard to show how bad we are. But if we do something good, where's that in the news? Okay? We need to, to muster our defenses. Okay, guys, they're out there. Not only, and, and it's, not, it's not a hostile back thing, it's a mercy mission. They're hostile, we gotta be merciful. What's our mercy? Despite the fact, I think of the soldiers when they watch somebody burn the flag. What does a soldier say? A good soldier says, I go overseas and fight so that you have the right to do that. Right, the soldier in some way, if, if it's a good soldier, has that ability to give that courteous statement back rather than to, you know, I'm sure what he's feeling, right? Ah, what are you doing? That's my flag, you know, but no. And so same thing for us. They're hostile. We got to kind of hold back that, that, that anger. We should have righteous anger, but not unrighteous anger. Instead of getting back at them, right, what are we doing? We're training so we can teach them, so we can preach to them, so they can learn the gospel, Okay. We need to read some books. Don't be scared. Mere Christianity is great. Okay? A Pilgrim's Progress, that's great. Those are classics. Let's read them together. There's also modern books, On Guard by William Lane Craig, a great apologetics primer. Greg Kukla has a great book called Tactics. Wonderful book written in language that anybody here can easily understand. Okay? We're in this together. We're in this together. We'll read them together. We're stronger together, dear ones. No one here should feel incapable or alone or, or whatever this morning. We're in this together. No one needs to pursue a doctorate, but if you decide to, I'm not going to stop you. If the Lord leads you, you go. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying you have to. But we could all pray a little more, couldn't we? We could all pray a little more. We could all read a little more scripture. We could all practice and get together a little bit more about these things. We could be a little bit more ready to defend the reason we have for the hope that we have. Okay? Even after what I shared with you this morning, maybe you still doubt that apologetics is necessary. I don't know. Or you doubt that it's a responsibility for all Christians. Maybe there's just a subset that really needs to be doing this. So let me say this. Maybe you, maybe you think that the Bible is it. Just quote verses, and that'll, that'll win the day. I'm not going to argue against that statement because we're talking about the Word of God. It's living. It's powerful. But history does tell a bit of a different story. 
Okay, throughout church history, many theologians, philosophers, they've offered reasons for believing the truth claims of Christianity. Okay, these apologists, these defenders of the faith, found that it was insufficient simply to declare what the Bible says, and they insisted on explaining why a person ought to believe what the Bible says. See the difference? So in addition to proclaiming that God exists, they've offered reasons for believing God exists. From the earliest preaching of the Christian church, Peter didn't simply shout, this Jesus, God raised up again. What did he do? He offered further, he said, to which we were all witnesses. That's an evidence statement. That's an apologetic statement. He's defending what he said, okay? On the basis of the apostles, having witnessed the resurrection, all the house of Israel scripture says in Acts chapter two, might know for certain that God has made him Lord and Christ because Jesus was witnessed by so many others. Evidence, that's defense of the faith. So I hope I didn't scare anyone this morning. I hope that you're all excited. <laughs> Got fun ahead of us? It's exciting to serve Christ. It's a privilege to serve Christ. It's awesome to serve Christ in this world needs us to be serving Christ and being faithful. I look forward to learning and training with all of you. We can all do our part in the Great Commission with zeal and courage because we will be well trained together. And so I'm ready to conclude. And a real conclusion, not pages long, just a paragraph. Listen to this. Jesus chose one highly educated religious person as an apostle. And that was Paul. The rest were fishermen, Peter, the tax collector, Matthew, political revolutionary, Simon, a doctor, Luke. They were just people of their day who were available and willing to be used by the Lord. They were filled with the Spirit of God and they were used as vessels of God. God uses all things for his glory. So we bear witness. We make disciples and we do apologetics. We defend the faith by faith. Remember, the hope that we give a reason for, it's not a what. The truth that we're defending, it's not a what. It's a who. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is no better reason to do the work before us than him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for protecting us once again with uh, just beautiful weather so we could gather outside here at the ministry house. Father, thank you for the blessing of this property you've, you've given the church an opportunity to have. Lord, just uh, direct us uh, in the months to come as we just uh, look ahead. What work do you have for us, Lord? We want to do it. Lord, help us to be diligent. Help us to train hard. Help us to be faithful. Help us to engage you at home and really work on our personal relationship with you and then help us to gather together and work on our corporate relationship with you. Lord, help us not to be intimidated. Help us to look for the opportunities that you have for us. Help us to respond to them when they come our way. Help us to give, uh, give us wisdom, Lord. Give us courage. Give us knowledge. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Anoint us for the work. Lord, help our relationships in this church to grow deep. We're going to need those in order to do the work because that's one of the ways, Lord, that this church is, the church is so special because this body, the hands and the feet, the eyes, the ears, all of us coming together, we get to know one another. We strengthen each other for the journey. We work together. We're stronger together, Lord, and we're strongest with you. So, Lord, we just commit this to you today. Lead us forward. Help us to share the gospel and be always prepared give a defense, give a reason for the hope that we, ha we have within us that is a who. His name is Jesus, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mr. Michael? Yes, sir. Uh, Michael is going to sing a very familiar hymn. Michael, maybe you could read the words first, I was thinking. Sure. And then, um, so just remember to hum it to yourself, sing it in your hearts, and then belt it on the way home. <laughs> <laughs>